uh, Professor Adams and Professor Morales, and distinguished guests. Uh, I must say, I do enjoy being um, able to mix with colleagues who are engineers as well as doctors and uh, scientists. I also am inspired by Norbert Wiener. And uh, I know we celebrate uh, his great scientific achievements tonight. He was a pioneering researcher, as you know, in stochastic and noise processing, and is considered the founder of cybernetics. He defined cybernetics as the scientific study of control and communication systems in both animal and machines comes from the Greek kybernon, uh, to steer or go govern. It is important for engineering, systems, control, computer science, biology, neuroscience, philosophy, and the organization of society. As with many geniuses, he was also very absent-minded, <laughs> and was said that he returned home once to find his house empty. He inquired of a neighborhood girl the reason, and she said the family had moved out that day. He thanked her for the information, and she replied, that's why I stayed behind, Daddy. <laughs> in, in, in 1967, when I set out to see if I could steer electrical stimulation of the auditory nerve past a malfunctioning inner ear and restore speech understanding for profoundly deaf people, I did not realize at the time that I was entering the field of cybernetics. In doing so, I came to learn that neurophysiology combined with electronics held some hope for the future. The importance of this relationship can be appreciated when we consider there are approximately one trillion excitable cells in the brain for nerves, muscles and uh, brain function. Each excitable cell has a voltage of seven millivolts and so is one twentieth of that of a AAA battery. We are thus made up of more than 20 billion batteries. Furthermore, the late Donald Mackay, a great uh, idol for me, said, the brain is best described as a computer, but really a vast community of linked microprocessors in addition, it has been thought that conscious experience is through the senses um, and the pattern of electrical activity in the brain. But my studies in patients suggest that we are more than electrical activity, but we are in fact communicating proteins. That brings me to my first scientific challenge, and that was to develop a cochlear implant, not known then as an implant, but electrical stimulation of a, the brain through a prosthesis. And it was not then even good enough to combine neurophysiology with electro electronics. There was a need to discover how patterns of electrical stimulation were perceived and how, how these perceptions could be understood as speech. To do this meant developing in conjunction with the University of Melbourne Department of Electrical Engineering an implantable box of electronics for multi-channel stimulation of an array of nerve fibers in the inner ear. In 1978 we implanted the most complex package of electronics ever surgically implanted in a patient. 
Then in 1978, that same year, our most significant breakthrough occurred when we discovered that stimulating different frequencies in the inner ear were not only perceived as pitch, as occurs with sound waves, but they were experienced as vowels. The vowels varied according to the site of stimulation in the inner ear for the resonant frequencies. The resonance depended on the shape of the oral cavity. This finding indicated that the neural connections in the brain had become arranged to decay specially important information that is relevant to speech understanding. The discovery of the successful speech code on our first patient made it the first prosthesis to provide speech understanding for profoundly deaf people using electrical stimulation alone. This also occurred for a second patient who had been deaf for many years, indicating that the conscious experience of speech can lie dormant for many years and retain synaptic connections in the brain and the unfolding of proteins. It was exciting to realize that it was the first sensory neural prosthesis to bring electric technology into a direct functional relationship with human consciousness. When it gave spoken language to children whose brains had never been exposed to speech, and was approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration, it became the first advance in helping profoundly deaf children to communicate in the last 250 years. In addition, the success of the bionic ear has led to the creation of a new discipline, which in 2003 was referred to as medical bionics. This discipline requires cross-fertilization from nanotechnology, electronics, trophic factor stem cells, and biomaterials to achieve the best outcomes. Such a center could lead to also bionic spinal cords, as we know from implanted or explanted spinal cords, there are nerve cells below the injury that are waiting to be stimulated. It can lead to bionic eyes as stimulating the retina or the visual cortex can lead to sufficient points of discrimination to give that visual acuity. With deep brain electrodes, there is time enough to record an abnormal rhythm and reverse an epileptic seizure. And finally, nanostructured interfaces for drug delivery are providing exciting new possibilities. Finally, I'd like to congratulate um, Professor Mariels and the whole team for this successful symposium to realize the vision of Norbert Wiener. I hope you will take away the pressing need to do convergent research for the next generation uh, that is of benefit to mankind. This field is truly one where exciting innovations will occur. Thank you.